Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk with Phil Huber, CIO at Savant Wealth Management and author of the investing book, The Allocator's Edge. The conversation with Phil is centered around how he invests his personal portfolio. We work through some of the alternative asset classes he holds outside of the more traditional stock and bond investments, and also how he thinks about achieving his long-term goals. These Show Us Your Portfolio episodes are here to give you insight on how financial professionals like Phil construct their own investment strategy and the rationale behind their positioning. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Savant Wells' Phil Huber. Phil, thank you very much for joining us today. Awesome to be here with you guys. Thanks for having me. We're going to talk about how you invest your personal money and how you think about, I think, achieving your goals and balancing risk and return. But I wanted to start out with you um, on two, I think, what are sort of fun and interesting facts. And... um, One's related to investing and one's more related to something that you're interested in personally. But on the investing front, one of the things that I have always found that's very cool that you you actually like built and developed um, or designed, I guess, was this periodic table of asset classes. Um, I've just always found that like super creative and valuable. I mean, you have like dozens of asset classes in this table format. And then you have for each like what would be effectively an element is an asset class. And put the chart in the podcast as well so people can see it. So if you're listening to this, pop over to YouTube and you'll see what really cool chart that probably took a lot of lot of work to um, put together. Yeah, it was a fun project a few years ago that, that we did. And I think it really turned into a really great visual, nice and colorful. I used it in the book as well. Um, can't can't go, go, go as colorful there. But uh uh, yeah, really the, the intent there was, was kind of twofold. One was just to kind of demonstrate that much as our understanding of the, the chemical world has evolved over time, you know, based on scientific discoveries, et cetera, uh, the, the same goes for investing. What, what we know today about investing in terms of building portfolios, different types of assets you can diversify with is a little bit different than it was, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so I think on one hand, kind of painting this picture of constant evolution and at the same time thinking about things from a elemental perspective and how you combine things together. I think there's some good parallels between chemistry and, and building portfolios and that when you combine different you know, elements together in different proportions, you get different chemical uh, compounds. And then same thing on investments, you, 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 know, you start with the objective in mind, what's, what's the investor trying to achieve and how do we mix and match these different uh, investing elements together to, to give the best odds of achieving whatever those objectives might be. The other thing, Phil, I want to ask you about is just personally, I know you're a diehard wrestling fan, so I wanted to ask you, you know, does this go like all the way back to the days of the Four Horsemen and Ric Flair? Or, you know, when did you actually start um, really watching and getting into wrestling? Probably, I think my first memories are when I was maybe four or five years old, kind of uh, late 80s, early 90s, the Hulkamania era. So I was more of a WWF fan and early on, but eventually found WCW and Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen. So I, I, I kind of ate, ate all of it up uh, over time. Well, if, if Jack asks any bad questions, you can give him a suplex. <laughs> maybe, maybe a figure four. <laughs> there you go. Nice. <laughs> so um, I definitely encourage people to go to Phil's blog. He does a lot of great writing about investment-related topics and planning. That's bitspieces.com, BPS and pieces.com. That's obviously a play on basis points. Um, which I think is also really cool and creative. And then Phil's book, The Allocator's Edge, goes much deeper into um, the various asset classes and alternative asset classes and asset allocation and how investors might want to approach you know, investing in alternatives. And I think we'll talk about some of that today as we get into how Phil personally invests his money. Um, so definitely check that stuff out. So Phil, let's start at sort of a 30,000 foot level with you. And the first thing we'd like to ask in these interviews um, is what are your, when you're thinking about your investments, what are your biggest goals that you're basically trying to achieve with your personal portfolio? Sure, you know, so, so I just turned 37. My wife's a couple years younger. We have a young daughter who just turned three. Um, 
And so I, I try to think of our investment time horizon from a really like a multi-decade, you know, time horizon standpoint. And so that lends itself to really a, a very kind of high growth equity centric type of portfolio uh, construction, because obviously we, we want to retire comfortably. But at the same time, I think even longer term, we have other things that we'd like to do as it relates to uh, creating a legacy, charitable intentions long term, um, you know, having some sort of, of um things that we can leave behind to our daughter or any other children that we have in the future or grandchildren. So, so, so really trying to have that long-term perspective, knowing that I think, I think we have a high likelihood that we'll, we'll outlive, you know, our, our money. And so we want to make sure that we can, you know, position the portfolio to live beyond us, to, to support other things other than our, our, our own retirement. All right. And then I, I also just wanted to ask you here before I hand it over to Jack is, you know, when you, look at your overall approach to investing and managing your portfolio, which we're going to get into a lot of the specifics because there is some unique stuff you're doing here. But, you know, how would you classify, I guess, your own personal approach to managing your portfolio? I mean, how do you think about sort of risk and return and really I guess, what, what you're trying to accomplish there? Yeah, I think I think on one hand, it's, it's we obviously want a meaningful long term return to, to compound over several decades um, to help us achieve what we want to in life. But at the same time, we're not 100% equity investors. Um, there, there might be others like kind of in the similar age range to me that, that do have 100% equity portfolios. The, the reason I guess we don't is, is kind of, you know, a few reasons. Um, one is, is just, I, you know, we're big, I'm a big believer in diversification. I think there's really uh, a handful of other complementary types of alternatives that, that can still deliver uh, meaningful returns and have modest to low correlations to, to stocks. Um, you know, at the same time, I think just kind of given where we are in life and where yields are today, we, we don't find any need or reason to have kind of core traditional fixed income as part of our portfolio. Um, and I think another element is just what I do for a living. I, I you know, work for a registered investment advisor. Our, our business is very much tied to uh, the stock market in many ways. Um, and, and also the, the biggest asset on our balance sheet is, you know, my, my equity within Savant. And so um, there's that sort of idiosyncratic asset as well, uh, very illiquid, but also, you know, kind of, kind of tied to, to the markets to a degree. Um, so, so all that kind of lends itself to wanting to have some non, you know, equity market exposure in some sort of material way into the, into the portfolio. Um, and, and so that kind of ranges from 15 to 25 percent, depending on how you account for the, uh, the, the, the Savant, you know, stock, if you will. But um, that, that, that's kind of the idea is have, have the you know equities do all the heavy lifting that's usually going to be three quarters or so of the portfolio and then round that out with other you know a, a, an ensemble of other diversifiers um that can just kind of help whether the, whether the rough patch is a little bit better in equity markets and, and and add diversification to the portfolio so at a high level you have you have equities you have your stake in the business and then you have alternatives are those the three main things you have in your portfolio yeah yeah that, that's really it and we can get obviously deeper into the alternatives mix and in there, it's you know in, in the conversation, but at least today, not to say that won't happen in the future, but I, I you know at least in the you know foreseeable future, I don't see any role for traditional bonds uh, as part of our, our allocation. You alluded to one of the interesting things in your portfolio, which is what's missing, which is you know a lot of people will have a significant bond allocation in your portfolio, and I'm wondering what is your thought process on that? Is it does it have to do with low expected returns now? Does it have to do with your long time horizon, and you don't really feel the need for bonds? Like, what is your thought process on not including bonds? I think it's it's a little bit of both. It's it's one hand is recognizing the environment that we're in, and I just think on a, on a after you know uh, tax after inflation basis, I just I, I, I'd rather deploy our, our capital elsewhere for for better returns um, and and still still achieve some level of diversification to, to stocks. Um, and I think it's it's also you know kind of based on the time horizon, and, and we also keep I think you know more than enough cash on the sideline for any you know unexpected you know, uh, expenses or, or large purchases that, that might come up so that we don't have to be for sellers of, of our, of our longer term assets at any point. And so kind of all those things together really, really don't uh, require the need for, for core fixed income. So that, that could change as we get a little bit older, but at the same time, I think just given, you know, m my work and what I do and just the overall sort of uh, intimacy with financial markets, I just, I feel comfortable enough with volatility of, of, of equities where I don't ever foresee a scenario where, you know, stocks don't represent at least half of our, our portfolio. No, even, even in retirement. Yeah. 
How do you think about equities right now with valuations? You know, we, we had Antti Oman on the podcast, and you know, he didn't paint the greatest picture in terms of expected returns for stocks going forward. You know, some investors are thinking about that and saying, all right, I need to lighten up on stocks. And then other people say, all right, I've got a long-term time horizon. I can't really worry about you know, timing with valuation. How do you think about that with respect to your personal portfolio? Sure. Yeah, I would say, first of all, Antti's great. I actually just saw him a couple of days ago. He was in Chicago for a lunch presentation, and I'm one of his biggest fanboys out there. So I, of course, brought my copy of his latest book to have him sign. And his first book, Expected Returns, is kind of like my investing Bible. So a, a ton of uh, admiration for uh, Antti and his work, uh, as, as well as AQR in general. But um, you know, the, the idea of, of elevated valuations, I think, you know, I'll make changes to our portfolio as, as it relates to longer term valuation driven kind of return expectations. But what, I, what I'd like to avoid is like all in and all out decisions on, on different asset classes or equities more broadly. Um, just this idea that I would ever take, you know, U.S. large cap stocks down to zero because we're, we're at, you know, historically high valuations. I just I, I recognize the low expected return come with those types of environments, but at the same time, what, what I would fear is my ability to get back in. I think going to cash creates sort of a security blanket when you're making those tactical types of, 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 of extreme decisions. And I, that, that would be my concern is, is um, okay, you know, maybe I, I reduce or get out <laughs> and maybe it works out well, but then what, what's the, what, you know, when do you get back in? And so I think the, you got to get the timing right you know, uh, twice to, to have those types of decisions be successful. So that's one side of it. The other is that, you know, uh, it's kind of like there's always, you know, some relative value somewhere. And so while there might be corners of the market where, where you know, again, valuations might be pretty nosebleed levels, maybe that's come down quite a little bit from where it was six months ago in, in some of those more uh, speculative or, 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 you know, pockets. But, um, you know, we, we, we typically, not just for my personal portfolio, but for clients of Savant, we have a strategic bias to value in our portfolio. So I think that, again, kind of gets you away from some of those extreme uh, you know, market type environments a little bit, and, and also very much a global focus, which has been a really painful thing for investors over the past, you know, decade or so. But I, I think if for a longer term horizon, I think there's, you know, some, some optimism to be had for non-U.S. exposures, uh, particularly those that have a value orientation. So, um, but, but I always want to have some, some, level, some degree of balance in the portfolio. So that's going to lead to being frustrated at certain times where you're, you're like, gosh, I wish I was, had, you know, in, in the 20 tons, all, all you wanted was more large cap growth. And that, that kind of hurt, but then you, you you know you can look back a decade prior to that where anything outside of large cap growth really helped you kind of weather what what, what when he referred to as the lost decade. Yeah, you know I have kind of a similar view to, to you. Like I, I you know typically, especially the binary decisions with respect to valuation, almost always end badly. But you know Med, Med Faber had this thing. I don't know if you saw it. Like he did this thing on Twitter, this thought experiment, and he Twitter poll. Yeah, he kept adding like making the cape higher and higher and saying like, would you abandon U.S. equities together all together? And he started, you know, at 30 or something, but then he got up to like a hundred and I'm like, oh, you know, I really don't believe in this, but if it actually got to like Japan levels, maybe I would. I mean, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to think about it. I mean, maybe, maybe we'll never get there, but it's an interesting thought experiment. Yeah, no, I remember seeing him do that on Twitter and I, I you know, I'm not sure what I replied in the poll, but it's kind of like, like hope, I hope we never get to the, those extreme levels that he was pointing out, but at the same time, like, I, if anything, maybe it would lead to just heavier, you know, uh, tilt to value uh, and, and away from the, the market as a whole or, or growth. But again, probably I, I feel pretty confident in saying that um, there won't be a point in my life where I have zero exposure to the U.S. stock market. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't either. How do you think you mentioned value? How do you think about using factors in your portfolio? I mean, do you use the major factors or are you primarily index based in how you select stocks? I mean, how do you think about that? Yeah, so so we, we you know utilize ETFs and, and mutual funds, um, and, and to get that broad based global diversification, you know ultimately try to keep you know taxes down you know where possible and um, you know fees at a reasonable level in terms of the underlying investments that we use. But um, yeah, we're, we're believers in factor investing, so we kind of think of it as a, a passive low cost core for your broad market exposure, and then satelliting around different types of a factor, uh, you know, uh, weightings on top of that. And so the, the most pronounced, you know, especially today is, is, is the value factor, but also, uh, you know, so some, some exposure to profitability and size and uh, momentum as well. And do you think this is something I always debate with myself about because I think I can do it and then, you know, I struggle with whether I actually can. I mean, do you think about like timing factors to some degree, not like timing them on a day-to-day -day basis, but thinking about like, oh, value is really cheap. 
keep, you know, I should be overweight value, or do you think it's better just to have sort of a multi-factor exposure you're consistent with? Generally, you know, just sort of a default exposure you're consistent with, but, but as Cliff Aston would point out, maybe sometimes it's, a, it's okay to sin a little bit uh, and, and overweight, so I would say that's kind of probably where we're at is a little bit heavier to value than maybe we otherwise would be in a more neutral environment, so maybe that changes over the next couple of years if the recent um, rotation, you know, continues on and, and things get a little, you know, bit narrower in terms of value spreads that are out there, but, you know, you, even with the uh, the relative outperformance over the past, you know, year or so, things are still looking pretty cheap, spreads are still historically high, so I, I think having that, you know, uh, kind of sin a little bias uh, uh, thesis still remains intact. Yeah, I tend to, I tend to agree with you, you know, as, as long as you can live with the timing thing, you know, I, I always tend to think I can time these things and you obviously can't, like, as, you know, for a long-term exposure, I think, like, it, it does make sense when these things are a little bit cheap, maybe to, to move a little bit towards them. Um, I want to ask you about alternatives because you, you wrote a great book about alternatives and, you know, one of the things you have in common, you know, our previous two guests were Wes Gray and Meb Faber, um, and they both also both had significant exposure to alternatives in their portfolios. So we're three for three so far. So I'm wondering if just you could talk at a high level, you know, about the benefits of alternatives and why you think, you know, they, what purpose they serve in your personal portfolio. Sure. Really, really just, it's meant to be a, a core suite of diversifiers, um, across some of the various components within alternatives, but that's also a very vague and generalized word. And so it doesn't, just saying I have, you know, 20% of my portfolio in alternatives doesn't really tell you a ton. Um, and so I think it's important to really poke under the hood. And that was a big part of writing the book was trying to sort of demystify this, this investment landscape a bit um, uh, and really sort of, you know, break it down and be comprehensive in terms of covering all the various asset classes and strategies that at least today kind of fall under that alternatives umbrella. So that, um, you know, interestingly enough, most people, when you, when you say that, they think of, of you know, probably private equity, venture, hedge funds, real estate are kind of the core alternative categories. There's also a host of other things that maybe are less uh, or a little, bit, a little more under the radar, things like insurance linked securities uh, or, or catastrophe reinsurance being one, uh, different forms of alternative credit. Um, you know, you look at real asset types uh, outside of real estate, things like infrastructure, farmland, timberland. Um, and then you've got the, the relatively nascent space of digital assets and crypto and, and, and some of the other kind of future, uh, you know, uh, looking alternatives that are, that are, you know, not quite ready for mainstream uh, uh, yet today. And so it's a pretty wide spectrum. We have a, a variety of different uh, return objectives, volatility levels, liquidity, um, exposure, you know, inflation sensitivity. So, so the, the, you know, depending on what the, your ultimate objective is as an investor, it might point you or... or Kind of lead you towards you know different types of alternatives, uh, but really I, I find value in, in, in looking at, at sort of a core mix that that serve as a way to generate more meaningful returns than I can get from fixed income while still preserving diversification benefits uh, relative to stocks. And so something like private equity, for example, uh, you know I kind of view the, the the exposure I have in my in, you know employer stock is is very much like a, a private idiosyncratic asset, so I don't see much need today to have other forms of private equity or startup investing in, in the portfolio, whereas um, that, that sort of 15 to 20 percent I referenced earlier of, of kind of that non-equity exposure, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a relatively balanced mix across some of the categories I mentioned between, you know, private debt, insurance linked securities, real assets, alternative risk premium, which is kind of what I think of, of you know, essentially hedge fund type strategies and a non-hedge fund wrapper. Uh, so I don't, I don't have any exposure to actual hedge fund like you know vehicles, but I, I do think there's a handful of hedge fund type strategies, especially those that can be kind of harnessed in a more systematic, uh, uh, low cost fashion. Uh, could have really powerful diversification benefits. That includes, you know, at least from from my own definition, includes things like managed futures, includes things like event driven strategies like merger arbitrage, et cetera, uh, and also things like style premium. So we mentioned value investing earlier earlier. Uh, uh, style premium would be sort of taking that same concept but applying it in a sort of long short uh, uh, fashion uh, as well as other types of styles things like momentum carry defensive etc and I will say for anybody interested in this I mean you said you have a, a variety of uh, you know alternatives you mentioned in the book but I mean you did the, the most comprehensive thing I've ever seen done on this um, you know there were things in there I, I follow this pretty closely and there were a lot of things in there I didn't even know existed so uh, you read the book I would highly recommend the book for anybody who wants to learn more about alternatives but you, you mentioned also in the book, on uh, the chapter on your personal portfolio, you mentioned the six alternatives that you have in there um, and, and your allocation to them. And we'll put a pie chart in the podcast to, to show the percentages to it. But I want to work through each one of them. And maybe if you could just explain sort of what they are and sort of how you think about your allocation to them. And you, you mentioned alternative risk premia a little, uh, a little earlier. Can you talk about 
like what that is and how you think about your allocation to that. Yeah, so I would say that's that's among the most uncorrelated to traditional markets in terms of the, the underlying strategies involved there. Um, you know, really, it's 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 this. You know, they're saying the hedge fund doesn't really tell you anything. There's thousands of hedge funds. They all operate differently, have different strategies. Over time, what became clear as that industry matured was that there was um, a lot of commonality across funds in terms of some of the things that were happening that were really less about alpha and more about this idea of like an alternative form of beta or kind of hedge fund beta, things that are more risk premium based uh, or, or compensation for um, sort of behavioral, behavioral types of risks that are out there. And so what, what you know, some of the liter literature that came out, you know, groups like AQR and others that really identified, okay, if you just look across the cross spectrum of hedge funds, you know, a lot less alpha than there was in the earlier days, a lot more beta than most people probably uh, expect. Uh, across that universe, and then uh, a lot more systematic kind of exposures than, than people might, might imagine from fund to fund. And so really, there's been this kind of emergence of, of alternative risk premium strategies that are saying, hey, there, there's some great things uh, happening in, 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 these, in these hedge funds, but they might not be worth two and 20. They're probably, you know, we could probably access them a lot cheaper um, and, and also in a more systematic quantitative fashion as opposed to bottom up sort of discretionary. And so some of the things that have come out are things like, you know, again, like merger arbitrage, where you're getting compensation for liquidity, you know, providing liquidity to the market, uh, trend following, which has its roots in, in behavioral economics, uh, and that kind of you know, speaks to managed futures. Uh, and then some of the classic, you know, sort of long short styles, value, momentum, carry, defensive, et cetera. And so um, a lot of those you can access through through more liquid, you know, vehicles today, uh, which just makes implementi implementation and access, you know, kind of broader in terms of who can, you know, approach these uh, types of strategies outside of, you know, institutional investors. Um, so, so that's kind of what I think of when I think of alternative risk premium is, is really kind of the, the beta of the hedge fund world. Yeah, I mean, that's been one of the cool things that's happened in recent years. It's amazing how many of these alternative strategies are now accessible through ETFs. I mean, if you, if you look back five, 10 years, I mean, you couldn't get a, a, very much of this at all. And now you can get a lot of it. So it, it's really cool. Yeah. And they're also not a, not a panacea either. I think that's, you know, the, the, much like any investment that, you know, they can go in and out of favor. And so, you know, using that sort of long, short value factor as, as, a, as an example, really, really tough strategy to hang on to, you know, 2018 through 2020. Uh, and, and it's having a phenomenal, call it year and a half right now. And so th that's the challenge with any of these things is sticking with them long term and not viewing them as tactical, you know, trading exposures, but really things that you want to kind of buy and hold for the long term, knowing that there's going to be, you know, potentially lengthy periods where you, you, you just, you know, they're really tough and painful to hold on to. But that, that's all that's all investing. That's that's why we get these long term risk premiums is, is that patience and discipline to hang on through uh, thick and thin. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know if you found this, but this is one of the things we found working with clients is a lot of times these strategies that look different, you know, are much harder for clients to hold on to than ones that may lose money when the market's losing money. So a lot of times that being different is much more difficult than the actual like actual losing money, you know, when the market's going down. Yeah. And, uh, un, un, you know, being uncorrelated sounds great in theory, but in practice, it's not, you know, not not as fun when the, the uncorrelated assets down and markets are up. And I think that's a challenge with as much as we believe and advocate alternatives. I, I think that comes with the caveat that a lot of time needs to be spent between advisors and their clients really educating them because, um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if they're going to uh, jump ship, you know, after the rough patch and not stick around for the inevitable, you know, uh, return, um, you know, then, then that's damaging to long term investment outcomes. And so there, there's still some investors that might be better off in a pure stock bond portfolio if, if, if the behavioral risks associated with investing in alternatives, you know, outweigh their benefits. Uh, but I think with enough sort of education and you know thoughtful communication around their role in a portfolio, what expectations should be, I, I think they they can really play a, a larger role going forward in helping to augment uh, traditional 60/40 type portfolios where, where those might be falling short. The next alternative you mentioned that you use is real assets, and do you think like is that a broad-based commodity exposure? Is that what you're thinking about there? Not necessarily that. It's, I mean, that, uh, commodities would fall under real assets. I kind of think of real assets as just things that ha, ha, you know have some tangibility or inflation sensitivity. What I what I focus on there, or we fo we'll focus on a savant, are really these four buckets of real estate, infrastructure, farmland, and timberland. So things that fall under the real asset umbrella, but that do have cash flows associated with them, as opposed to commodity futures that do have, you know, again, kind of more stability and in, in income as opposed to the volatility that we see with long only uh, commodities. And so, um, uh, but, but things that can, again, you know, pro provide 
some potential benefits to a portfolio in an environment like we're seeing today where um, you know, you know, inflation can be that kryptonite for, for stocks and bonds and, and really disrupt that historical uh, correlation you know, uh, uh, benefit that you see from, from fixed income. The third one you mentioned is one you just have a small exposure to, but it's one a lot of people might not be familiar with, which is this idea of novel assets. So can you explain what that is? Yeah, that, that's kind of, uh, you know, things that are uh, either, uh, you know, n really new, like like crypto, as much as cryptos, you know, kind of cross the chasm into the mainstream and seems to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the headlines quite a bit. It's still a very nascent asset. It's only existed for, you know, 10 to, you know, 13 years. Yeah, and so these are very immature assets still. And so I, I think that is, is still kind of falls under that novel uh, area, despite it, despite having a, a, a dedicated uh, sleeve of it in my in my uh, personal portfolio uh, that that I reference in the book. The other aspects of novel investments would be things that aren't necessarily new, but are but are kind of becoming uh, newer to invest in thanks to advances in fractionalization um, and and the emergence of different types of platforms and apps that almost are, are, are kind of bypassing the fund complex to a degree and going direct to consumers. Uh, and so within that, you have things like artwork, um, collectibles, et cetera, that, again, the, the people have been investing in artwork and collectibles for years, but you typically had to be extremely wealthy and you're looking to, to buy, you know, uh, items, you know, outright and, and take ownership of them, where really this, this is a new dynamic in those areas where you're not taking, you know, a, a possession of, of a piece of art or a certain collectible, you're, you're buying fractional ownership of it. Uh, where, where it's being kind of held in storage somewhere. And so I think it's a different kind of way to access these types of, of kind of store of value types of asset classes. And those are just two. There's a lot of other types of um, kind of emerging sort of tech enabled alternatives out there. And so I, I tinker around with this area just because I'm, I'm curious and I like to kind of get my, my feet wet a little bit. And so it's a, it's a pretty de minimis part of, of my portfolio. But I, I, just, I find it helpful to experiment and tinker a little bit with things that are a little bit more on the frontier just to have a pulse on, on kind of what might be coming down the road longer term in terms of, 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 of how we, you know, of changing investing behaviors, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting how many things you can invest in now that you, you couldn't invest in before. Like there's so many, like you mentioned art, there's there's so many things that we can invest in now. But you know, another thing that it was good about the way you did this in your personal portfolio is you took a small allocation to it. You know, you're, you're kind of dipping your toes in it, you're experimenting with it. But, you know, a lot of people tend to maybe get a little too aggressive in these things. So that, that, I think that's that's a very sound approach to doing it. Yeah, and I think there's, there's other things under that kind of novel asset umbrella that I haven't touched yet or, or allocated to, but just things like uh, uh, income share agreements and... Um, you know, things of that nature that, that I think are just, you know, fun and interesting to, to, to keep an eye on. And, and, you know, maybe at some point they comprise a portion of that uh, part of the portfolio, but, but not yet today. The fourth one you mentioned is credit. Uh, how do you think about investing in credit? Yeah, so I, I kind of view this alternative credit sleeve as anything outside of public, you know, credit markets. So that could be, you know, middle market uh, direct lending to, to corporations. It could be asset back lending. It could be other you know, more esoteric forms of credit, things like litigation finance or uh, pharmaceutical royalties, things of that nature, um, or, you know, kind of technology enabled lending to consumers and small businesses. And so um, the way I access all these different, you know, areas is, is, is through uh, interval funds. So that, that's been a, I think, an interesting fund wrapper that, that's, that's grown in popularity in recent years, where it's not quite a private fund, it, uh, but it's also not quite a mutual fund. It sort of sits in between where, where it shares a lot of the same features as a mutual fund uh, in the sense that it's got a ticker symbol, it's got daily NAV, 1099 tax reporting, you know, 1940 Act regulation. But where, whereas you can buy and sell a mutual fund or an ETF daily, Typically, these interval funds offer quarterly uh, redemption windows, so, so you can't sell them as frequently, but that's by design because the assets that they're holding underneath the hood are inherently less liquid, and so you don't want to have a liquidity mismatch between the vehicle and the underlying investments. But I, I think it's a really great structure in the sense that it's, it's not perfect, uh, but, but it's also really kind of opened up uh, certain types of asset classes that might be... Um, you know, out of reach for, for most investors that, that either don't have the minimums or the accreditation or what have you to access, you know, private vehicles. Um, so, so I think, I think it's kind of a nice in-between, whereas maybe, you know, 10 years ago, whatever the case might be, you had this sort of binary spectrum. It was either fully daily liquid investments or you're locking up your money for 10 to 15 years. Whereas I think now between, you know, things like interval funds and tender offer funds and a, and a couple of other sort of registered semi-liquid products, there, there's a nice middle ground there on the liquidity spectrum. The fifth one you mentioned a little bit before, digital assets, but you, you had it broken out separately in, in the book. And I wanted to ask you about it because it's something I think about a lot too. 
in terms of like how I get exposure to that if I want to get exposure to it. And we're not going to obviously talk about any individual digital assets or anything like that, but I'm just wondering, like, do you think about taking like an indexed approach there or do you think about trying to select certain digital assets? How do you think about that? Yes. I mean, the vast majority of my exposure there is, is, is the two sort of, you know, blue chip, most common, you know, assets in that space, Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, a handful of other things at a, at a much smaller, smaller degree. So I think that, I think, I think there could be some, some interesting things to do there from an index perspective. Longer term, I don't invest in any sort of index fund. It's, it's direct, you know, asset ownership, um, and I think that's the best route to go for, for most people. I, I, you know, as much as there's a convenience factor to things that you can buy inside of a Schwab or a Fidelity account, um, I think those come with some, some pretty large deficiencies in terms of um, providing that that purity of exposure to the asset. Should you want to, you know, enter there, um, and and some of that's these these, you know products that trade at large premiums or discounts to the underlying asset value, and that's, that creates huge discrepancies in performance. There's futures-based products that, yeah, they were approved by the SEC, but they're not really giving you, you know, direct access. And so I, I think more often than not, the best path is, is to really own the assets outright um, and, and have a, a proper custody solution in, involved for, for cold storage purposes. But um, that, that's kind of how I think about that. But, you know, again, very, very much a speculative part of the portfolio. I, I like to joke that the volatility in crypto just makes me makes me um, feel better about the volatility in stocks, and then I kind of just ignore it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> if anything, it's like something like a, a distraction to pay less attention to what's happening in my stock portfolio. It's it's almost like a good training ground. Like if you could send clients into crypto for a little bit, like when they got the stocks, they'd be like, "This is nothing." Yeah, I kind of. I mean, there's the old saying that like a bad uh, a bad year for bonds is like a bad day for stocks, and 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 for similarly, like a bad you know, weekend for crypto is like a bad year for stocks. <laughs> and the last one you had is another one people might not be familiar with. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what it is. It's an insurance linked securities. Yeah, this is I, one of my favorite, just from a, a pure you know diversification standpoint. It's one of the really very few uh, uncorrelated asset types out there. There's, you know, it's exposure to natural events and, and catastrophes. So really out, outside of traditional financial markets. And so all, all the things that are top of mind today for investors as it relates to inflation and, and interest rate volatility and equity markets, those really don't impact the, the returns to reinsurance. It's more like our hurricanes happening that, that are landfalling and causing insurable damage, our, our wildfires, our earthquakes happening. And so, you know, not that it's riskless, it certainly is, is accompanied by risk, but it's a different form of risk that can be really powerful in the context of a broader portfolio. And it's one that's historically delivered pretty pretty solid results uh, in, in addition to the, the correlation properties. And so, um, you know, that, that's one I like a lot. There's, there's a handful of different types of insurance linked securities that kind of fall under that umbrella. Uh, on the more liquid end of the spectrum, there's things like catastrophe bonds, uh, that, that, that there's a ability to access that via mutual funds. And then there's less liquid types of insurance linked securities, things called quota shares, other forms of, of ILS that uh, can, can be owned inside of interval funds because they're less liquid. So. Um, I, I think it's a, a great diversifier, uh, 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 and they're, they're typically you know floating rate, uh, no credit risk, and so really you're kind of shielding yourselves from a lot of those macro risks that impact financial markets uh, by by bearing this other diversifying source of risk. You touched on this idea of liquidity, and it's something you talk a lot about in your chapter in the book about your personal portfolio. I'm wondering how do you think, you know, you have some things that are more liquid here and some things that are a little less liquid. How do you think about this concept of liquidity when you think about your overall portfolio? Yeah, not even just my own portfolio, but also like how, how we think about it for clients, right? Or how investors in general should probably start to think about it a bit more than they used to. I think historically there's, there's just been this sort of default, um, you know, unless you were like a really high net worth investor or an institution, you didn't give a lot of thought to liquidity. It was just assume that 100% of your portfolio would, you know, be daily liquid in individual securities or, or mutual funds or ETFs. But if you really step back and think about it, most investors don't need 100% daily liquidity in their portfolio. Um, and, and so really it's been kind of a, a reimagining of, okay, well, what does that mean? Every, every client, every investor is gonna have different um, feelings about liquidity, a different time horizon, um, different potential liquidity or income needs. And so that can really you know, sort of influence how, what, what the appropriate level of, of illiquid exposure is. But as I alluded to earlier too, it's not, it's not a binary like daily liquid versus you know, lock up your money for a decade now. There, there's there's uh, vehicles and asset classes that, that sit sort of in between, you know, venture capital and, and public stock markets where you can, you know, bear some illiquidity, but but it could be maybe quarterly or, uh, a, a, you know, a handful of years as opposed to, to 10, 10 or more years. And so 
Um, I think it's, it's really more of a personal exercise, kind of figuring out where you fit on that spectrum and sort of budget you have for illiquidity. But I think if you can relax that constraint a little bit, that that could open up, uh, you know, the, uh, the door a little bit to other sources of diversification that maybe aren't accessible inside of a daily liquid wrapper. This is another question I ask myself about my own portfolio a lot, this idea of inflation. So there, there seem to be two camps with inflation. One is if you have a long-term investment strategy that makes sense, then you don't really have to worry about inflation. And the other is, you know, we've had this 40-year period where stocks and bonds have had incredible performance. Like we may have a changing regime here. There might be some adjustments around the edges that should be made in your portfolio around inflation. Like, what do you think about that? Do you think there are changes? Are you, are you thinking about changes or have you made any changes in your portfolio to account for inflation? Not really. Like I, I take comfort knowing that like in a, in a year like this, like that there are things that, that have positive sensitivity to inflation in my portfolio that have, you know, you know, delivered positive results for the year. And so there's a, ni a nice behavioral effect there where it's like, yeah, the vast majority of my portfolio, like, like just about everybody else's is, is down for the year, but there's also some, some, you know, green shoots in there, some, uh, positions that, you know, whether it be net futures or real assets that are kind of doing what you expect them to do, uh, in an inflationary environment and helping uh, diversify that risk. I, I don't, I, th I think the word inflation hedge gets, gets thrown around too much these days. I, I don't need or want a, a direct inflation hedge like tips in the portfolio because I don't have any near term spending needs uh, from the portfolio. And so I really think of it more from that's why I have this equity centric portfolio is to deliver returns over the long term that are going to, you know, out, outpace inflation. You know, the, the year over year number we saw 9%, whatever it was, that, that's not going to persist for the, you know, uh, the, the duration of my investing time horizon. Not to say that it's not painful or impacting areas that, that we might be spending on in our personal lives, but at the same time, I, I, I don't feel the need that I have to hedge my portfolio for inflation. It's more about ha have some things in there that, that, that can you know provide diversification when inflation is, is wreaking havoc on, on traditional assets. Um, but also at the same time, no, no I'm looking for long-term inflation protection, not direct near-term inflation uh, hedging. And do you, do you do any startup? You know, a lot of people these days are doing a lot more startup and, you know, private type investing. Um, do you do any of that? I know you mentioned one thing in the book that might be tied to your, uh, your interest that Justin mentioned at the beginning in wrestling. But uh, do you do any startup type investing? Very seldomly. Like, again, I think just partially based on the, on the concentration of, of my, you know, uh, equity and savant. It's a big portion of our, our, our balance sheet, and that's very illiquid. And so I think it's more, more about how much additional true illiquidity do we want to add there. And at the same time, I just, you know, again, I think I've got a pretty good risk tolerance, but at the same time, the, you know, the idea of, of putting money in something where there's a high probability that it goes to zero, um, some people are, are, are okay with that. I, I, I behave really, have a really tough time with that. So, I, you know, I've made a couple exceptions to that rule over time. You know, you, uh, we'll, we'll maybe get later on to the, the wrestling uh, thing, but also, um, you know, I, obviously from the book and just my own kind of passion within the industry, like, you know, a lot, a lot of att attention paid to alternatives, and I think you know, really, as we look forward into the future, there's going to be a lot more uh, kind of technology linking the wealth management space to the alternatives world. And so, I pay a lot of attention to, to some of the newer technology players out there in that world, some of the different platforms that are emerging. So, I, I have made a small investment into a, a a kind of private alternatives platform for RAs that that it, it would would kind of fall under that startup umbrella. But it's really, you know, again, kind of knowing and having conviction in the founding team and um, and, it, and it being connected to something that I have a lot of, of interest and passion in. So, um, but I, I don't, I don't look to, I don't look to do a ton of that. Maybe that'll change, you know, uh, down the road at some point, but, uh, for now it's, it's very de minimis. I feel like I'm using this podcast to ask you a lot of questions I struggle with myself and my, my last one sort of meets this, uh, test as well. But, you know, one of the things we have in common with you is, you know, we have a business that's very tied to the stock market. So, you know, our income is to some degree tied to the stock market. The value of our business is tied to the stock market. And I think a lot about, you know, what should that mean for my personal portfolio? You could argue I have a lot of beta exposure because of all these things going down when the market goes down. Do you do you make any changes to your portfolio because of that? Or, or do you kind of put that to the side and, and sort of treat that separately? I, I like to look at it both ways. I, I think even if that wasn't there, the portfolio you know, uh, makeup would, would probably look pretty similar. You know, maybe, maybe I'd be more open to, to, to doing some private investments uh, if that other illiquid, you know, asset wasn't in the picture. But um, in terms of, of overall mix, you know, n not as much. It sounds like the personal portfolio is somewhat aligned closely to how you're actually managing your clients' portfolios to some extent. So this might be not really a relevant question, but I'm just curious, is there anything that you're doing with your 
personal portfolio that you wouldn't recommend your average investor do? Yeah, probably a few things. Yeah, I, mean, I would say there, there's a high degree of overlap with what, a, what an average, you know, savant client portfolio looks like with, with what my own looks like. I would say, you know, I'm probably a little bit more aggressive on the risk tolerance side than, than our average. And you know, again, we, we work with so many clients, but if you were to think of an average balanced client, retiree type, that they're probably more conservative, have more bond exposure, et cetera. But in terms of the underlying investments within alternatives, within, you know, equities in particular, you know, uh, almost, you know, entirely overlapping in terms of the same funds being used. Uh, outside of that, I, I like to think as much as I, we, you know, espouse evidence-based investing and that's what we want the, really the core uh, of the portfolio to be. One thing that, that I've evolved with over, over the last few years is, is having a, a, a little bit of a budget for fun, if you will. Uh, and so I, I like to think of, okay, I, you know, carving out 10% of the portfolio or something along those lines for just different types of things maybe are a bit more speculative that are really just kind of more for entertainment or joy or curiosity or just kind of general, you know, tinkering or experimentation. And so I think just having that small budget of, you know, kind of, you know, fun money to, to, to you know, know, knowing that regardless of what happens there, it's not going to disrupt our fi financial plan. And if anything, you know, if I'm paying a disproportionate amount of, of, of attention to the smaller piece, it kind of helps me just continue to think long term and, and not not touch or tinker with or mess with the the, the true you know meaningful long term money. Um, so so that's not for everybody. Not not everybody has the same active interest in financial markets or some of these other more esoteric you know types of, of, of uh, alternative investments. And so if, if you know for the average person that doesn't, I would probably discourage them from doing that. They don't. You know, you don't need to. Nobody needs that sort of release valve, but I just find it something that, you know, again, because of, of my kind of passion around uh, of financial markets that I, I just think it's, you know, something that I didn't always do, but I just, again, it's, it's more for entertainment uh, uh, purposes. One of the things that I sort of think about with this whole new generation of investors that have come online over the past few years is that they learned, hopefully, early in their investing career from their mistakes that they made. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, when you look back at the way you've managed your portfolio, um, has there been, have you, you know, is, has there been any sort of mistakes and what have you, what have you actually learned, um, from those? Yeah, I think, I think those earlier mistakes are, are more errors, errors of omission, um, where, where, you know, if you look at, like, I, I kind of joined the workforce and, you know, mid 2007. So my, my earliest experience with like a 401k or just a, an investment portfolio was seeing seeing my contributions get cut in half. Um, granted, that was at a, at a much smaller you know dollar level than, than today. But I, I think you know being really green at that point in the first few years of my career um, and, and kind of learning the ropes and, and not necessarily being a student of the market uh, to the degree that I, I kind of view myself today. Um, didn't really have an appreciation for what great opportunities those were. And so, you know, again, kind of hindsight 2020, I wish I would have been more aggressive in that 08 or 09 period of putting, you know, dollars to work, maybe, maybe, you know, not spending as much on weekends out at the bars with my friends and, you know, saving a little bit more so I could, you know, really, you know, uh, average into these, these, these generational kind of buying opportunities. But even after that, like, you know, other volatile periods like 2011, for example, you know, that European, again, just like being thoughtful about, okay, like the volatility is the price of admission. It's also your, your, you know, your friend is a long-term investor. You're getting a opportunity to invest at lower prices. So I just, you know, wishing I would have been a little more aggressive. I think I've learned from that. Like I, I, you know, March, you know, not that I bought exactly at the bottom, but like March, 2020, like I was, was I finally was like, you know, it was like, okay, this is uh, a pretty big move in a short period of time. It's really scary. It never feels good to put fresh dollars to work when, when there's so much uncertainty in the world. But um, I think it's more about just, you got to find ways to be dispassionate about those environments and, and try to automate those types of behaviors as best as you can. And so um, th that's probably the biggest error is just not recognizing the gift of volatility as opposed to the fear that, that that's, uh, you know, behind it. Yeah. And that's even, even for people that might not be like actively aggressively contributing, like kind of rebalancing. I mean, we're sort of talking about market timing a little bit, but rebalancing into those big declines where if certain parts of your portfolio have held up, I mean, maybe you rebalance, you know, taking some stuff that has held up better and putting it into stocks when you get those opportunities. How do you think about, um, I don't know if you own a rent, but how do you think about housing um, in the context of your overall investment portfolio? Uh, so, so yeah, so we, we, we own a home, our, uh, uh, we still have a mortgage on it, but um, we, we bought about four, a little over four years ago. 
Um, and, and so we, we don't treat that as part of the investment portfolio. That's not, you know, I, I don't, don't view it as an investment asset, uh, you know, really to any degree. Um, you know, in terms of that rent versus own decision, I, you know, we, we had rented for, you know, many years in the city. And I think as, as we were getting ready to start a family uh, and relo- relocate to the suburbs, it was time for us to, you know, uh, uh, experience the American dream, buy a home, you know, establish long-term roots. I moved a lot in the city you know, when I was younger. I really got really sick of moving. It's not a fun thing. So we wanted to find a home that we felt like we could stay in and raise a family in for, you know, at least 10 to 15 years. And so, um, you know, that was kind of what led us to buy. And, we, you know, we love our, our town and our neighborhood that we're in. It's a, it's a great place and we feel like we'll be there for a while. You know, there's also, a, you know, there's no, there's no shortage of, of, of expenses that come up and projects to do when you're a, a homeowner. And so, again, I think people tend to exclude that stuff when they think about like when they end up selling a home versus what they bought it for they tend not to think about all the money they've poured into it in terms of what their gain investment gain might be considered so i, I just that, that's a big part of why i just try to try not to even consider that as an investment asset uh and before you know it's, it's a money pit <laughs> a lot of the time after we talk about money and all these one of the things we like to do always at the end is talk about maybe some personal investments that might not be the greatest financial investments but that have been very valuable in your life and so for example for me i own a racing sailboat um, and that's that's about the worst thing you could possibly invest in from a financial standpoint. It requires upkeep. It's expensive. You know, it, it just loses tons of money. But I've, I've gotten a lot of joy in my life out of it. So I'm wondering if you have anything like that in your life where maybe it's not the greatest financial investment, but it's been great for you personally. Yeah, I think two things that come to mind are and both kind of in that, you know, pro wrestling, uh, you know, area, which is, is outside of work and family, my, my biggest, you know, kind of passion and, and interest in life. Um, so serendipitously a, a, a few years ago got introduced. So most people are familiar with WWE. They're at the big conglomerate within pro wrestling. Um, but what, what non-fans probably don't realize there's a lot of other smaller, uh, wrestling promotions that are, they're considered like independent and don't have as much, you know, exposure or audience, but, but, um, that are doing some interesting things for, for fans. Um, and so got introduced to, um, uh, a founder of one of those that, that's running it, and they were looking to raise some outside capital to just grow and, and continue to, you know, build their TV presence and live events, et cetera. And so, just from conversations there, it was, it was just a cool thing. Like, where you know, if I was a kid, I never thought there'd be an opportunity to like really, you know, be able to like participate uh, in an active way in, the, in this industry that I've been so passionate about my life. And so, you know, again, it was a, it was a pretty small investment, so, but just having that like direct connection to the the promoter of this you know, wrestling promotion. And, and so again, it was kind of one of those, like, I'm not doing this because I'm expecting a certain level of return. I'm doing it because it's, it's, it's just, uh, getting me exposure to this area of, of, of my life that I, that I really enjoy. And so, um, you know, if there's, if there's upside that comes from it, that, that's awesome. Um, and then separate from that, I'm, you know, in addition to watching, I'm also a collector. And so I, I, I was a big action figure collector when I was a young kid. Uh, fortunately, my parents hung on to a lot of that in their basement. And then a few years ago, when they moved to a new house, they, they dropped off all the all the old stuff uh, that was still there. And so that kind of re-sparked my, my interest in collecting, uh, collecting a little bit, which has taken on a life of its own the last couple of years. And, and my wife, you know, probably hates that there's like a, a box showing up at our, our doorstep, well, you know, <laughs> at least once a week of, of some, you know, figure I've ordered online or on eBay or something. And so, got you know, and, and she's she's been, you know, uh, nice enough to allow me to basically overtake half of our basement for my uh, my display, my collection display, and that's kind of one of those fun things where I just, again it, it provides pure enjoyment. Um, I have no plans to sell any of these, you know, you know more valuable ones, but it's kind of one of those things like it, it gives you pleasure. And at the end of the day, if there's a, it's almost like a having a call option. Yeah. So and recently, there's a lot of collectible stuff like that it is gone, is like really shot up in value. Is that true with the wrestling stuff as well? I think so. Like I'm still. I, I, I guess I'm even though I've, I've uh, it's been a lot of time there in the last couple of years. I guess I'm still probably like a, a kind of newbie relative to people that have been doing it for a lot longer. So I, I've definitely overpaid for certain things on eBay, I'm sure, in the last couple of years. But it, I mean, it is crazy when you see like when you know what these things go for on retail and when you go, you know, to buy something online that, that you know, came out five, six years ago. And you're like, can't believe what you're paying for it. Like, yeah, like it, it, there, there's some like, you know, grails out there that, that are really rare and hard to find. And I think that's the same for any sort of collectible uh, you know, category, but yeah, I think it's, you know, everybody's got their own sort of collectible things they gravitate to. It could be, you know, watches or, or, you know, uh, NFTs art you know, car, classic cars, et cetera, wine, you know, there's, there's a collectible category, I think for every person out there that might overlap with some area of interest they have.
Phil, you're single-handedly driving the price of uh, wrestling figurines through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask, do you have the stretchable Hulk Hogan, the one that it's like a rubber? You know what I'm talking about? I don't know. No, I, I, I kind of stay true to the, the the ones I liked as a kid. So if you remember, if you remember the Hasbro ones, those are those really small ones that had like the the like kind of uh, motion, different different types of motions and stuff. So uh, those are the ones that kind of bring me back to being a kid and, and playing with these things. Cool, cool. Well, I think it's awesome that you have something that you can be sort of passionate about. You know that you know, and it's it's fun for you. I can tell you certainly enjoy it. So that's that's really cool. Um, we, we have a standard closing question we like to ask all of our guests, and that is, um, if you could impart one lesson um, you've learned from building your personal portfolio to the average investor, what would that be? I would say just know that over time, your portfolio and your investment philosophy is going, going to evolve. Um, so, so maybe don't you know cling too tightly to, to your current investment beliefs, but at the same time, you also... Uh, to, to kind of borrow a, a quote that I heard, I think originally from Cliff Asnes when he was on Corey's uh, podcast was, you know, keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. And, and I think it kind of ties together with this idea of like uh, holding your strong beliefs loosely. So, you know, you, you don't always want to be turning over your portfolio or changing your stripes based on the whims of, of the market and what, what's happening in, in the near term and, and whatever noise is out there. But at the same time, like, don't be so rigid in your thinking that you can't be open-minded to, to evolving over time. So that, that, that's probably the one thing I've learned from my own experience that's, I think, been helpful and that, that I would try to, you know, impart to anyone who would be listening. Thank you, Phil. This has been great. If people want to learn more about your firm, um, I think we mentioned the blog website, but, um, you know, or your Twitter handle, where can they go to learn more? Sure. So, yeah, you, you can find me in a few areas. So savantwealth.com is our, our company uh, uh, website. Uh, and I do periodically write there in addition to writing on my uh, more personal investing blog, which you, you mentioned earlier is Bips and Pieces. And so that's uh, bpsandpieces.com. Uh, and that's also my Twitter handle at Bips and Pieces. You see me on Twitter probably more than I, than I need, need to be. And so those are, those are the primary ways you can, uh, uh, you know, touch base or see what I'm talking about or thinking about. And then, of course, the, the book is called The, the Allocator's Edge, uh, a, modern, a modern guide to uh, alternative investing in the future of diversification. And you can find that at Amazon or any, any online bookstore, hopefully. Great. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for being so open and sharing your portfolio with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thanks, guys. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.